First the way, briefly introduce the data, and then we go to the model and the conclusion. We try different model. And uh, see what the way, to the project, the you know, layout of the accelerator, the detector we are working here, actually out of four of the. So this is a located uh, in area, that's boundary of uh, France, that side of France, this is the uh, Swiss. So that is uh, high energy physics, what they are doing is very simple. They have uh, actually the high energy particle in this particular detector here. We use the dedicated proton probe in each batch. So the current batch is really the very small, like your head. So this is uh, need a high technology to make this two bunch create it here, actually. So that is not an easy way. You don't have the technology. So when it pro two particles collide each other, because of smaller cross section, you generate many, many particles. The sub particle, you can detect the high energy physics, yeah, detect the, that kind of signal. The signal basically is just the when the signal, particle, subparticle, it does like a tree. Can be any kind of, many kind of particle. So detect the happen in many, many ways, as you see here. Detect the, the speed, the path. So actually, this is dependent on the geometric location, the longitudinal and the transverse. So in our data, basically, we don't have that detail. Basically, it's a simple model already. So what we're doing is just from this is result, not the result data, it's already include the simulation. So we have a lot of missing data because the some kind of just not available from data. Another feature is that very weak signal. In this case, uh, we had a simulation. So the already very balanced, the true signal and the background, the ratio already good, but still very we the signal you know, compared with the one on one, the not one on one, one one hundred something like that. Yeah. So that is a special case when we need to pay attention to the wave signal. You know, just for your attention, but you know, this is a kind of cross section, the interaction, largely different than the energy particle. You will see so from the important future, we see energy come first always. That's true. If you miss energy, Ah, so the particle, this two signal will miss, you will not detect the true signal. So you, you make sure that the energy particle is correct. So we did some uh, data engineer, so basically, you can see, look at the many missing, even not only color, which is same color, we have uh, 70%, and three color, we have to 40%. And you look at the raw data, each, each sample, let's see, you have some two signals in your background, both can have a high, and high emission. So the conclusion is that the missing data is clear. You cannot drop any sample, you cannot drop any column. So what we add, uh, we add in the new future, not much, I'm pretty sure we add minimum, like uh, the transparency momentum some for each particle. Uh, so okay, we'll we'll start with logistic regression, and then we'll go through random forest. Um, what else did I do? Uh, GVM, the gradient boosting. Uh, I didn't include the SVM I did here because I didn't submit it on the Kaggle board. Um, and we have XG boosting in your network. So quickly going through logistic regression, I use the dimension reduction method of PCA. Um, before going to this method, I did scaling the data, impute the missing value. The way I treated the missing value was, I kind of look at it in the three different ways. Because from the previous slides, uh, if you look at the percentage, 30%, 15.3%, uh, and then 70%. The way I treated the the 15% was I imputed the mean, 
Uh, for the 30%, I look at the switch was actually the PRI jet numbers. So if it's zero, it's zero. So I impute it for those missing values, I impute it zero for the missing value because it actually tells me something. If it's zero, it means it didn't detect anything on the jet uh, ID number column. And then for the 70%, I use it uh, bootstrapping, just randomly replacement equals true, and then getting the whatever 30% data out into the missing value. Probably the, not the best way to do it, but this is how I understand the data. That's how I did it. For the PCA, I end up choosing 15 synthetic variables on this. Um, I actually tried different PCAs just to look at the final result, but I, I did choose five at first because that's where the elbow is. Probably that makes more sense. But 15, my argument would be if I look at uh, one that is where everything above the one kind of line, uh, that, would, that would be my argument to answer that question. No. Because the right then uh, generates by random matrix. And so, so if, if it's random, that mostly means it's almost Right? No? They're all on the same line. Yeah. Uh, remember that every variable contains uh, on the PL data set about right. one, uh, one, one difference in each of them, right? Uh -huh. The reorganization of the same information pushes more of the principal components in the earlier one and less down the line. Right? So the eigenvectors represent the amount of information that you gain or lose in respect of one. Right? One original feature. So if it's below one, than the original feature. Okay. Just remember it has to be compared to the original feature. Perfect. <laughs> yes, so I move forward with 15. So I recreated the 15 synthetic variables uh, using the what we have 42 um, variables now. So I end up with 15 synthetic, and then I did logistic regression uh, five fold cross validation for five times. And the, uh, uh, the AOC is 77.5% on the training data, which is an 80-20 split on the entire training data set. Um, this uh, after, I didn't really tune this too much. So a couple of things I learned from PCA for logistic regression, this is the first model I did. Uh, one thing was I didn't really, when I training the model, I didn't use AMS as the the goal for the twin, uh, tuning, I actually use accuracy. Um, so when you look at this data, because the signal and the background noise is not 50 50 percent uh, distributed, so you're actually trying to push the more left corner, which is true, true. Uh, so once there's a signal, you want the percentage of detecting is higher. So I didn't really push for that. Um, I just kind of knowing that this is something that I need to fix for the next model. So next I did was random forest, sorry. Um, so random forest, I did number of trees, 500, number of variables, seven, um, add the M try. These are, first give you kind of the importance of different variables, and then I actually end up using the top 30 variables to retrain the data set. It actually gives me a better result. So for, uh, for the area under the curve, the AOC is 85 in this case, and accuracy is about that, the 80.3% on the test training data, test data set, which is 20% of the training, and then it is 85 on the training data set. So it's not too overfitting from my perspective for this uh, random forest, because random forest does have a tendency of overfitting because it goes down to everything. And then the AMS in this case is 1.24. And then, because um, my understanding is you're kind of going down the tree randomly selecting these variables and do the 
tree going down for one testing, and then you random selecting another set and then go down. So um, uh, technically, you should be able to cover the entire training data set using this method if your M try is large enough. Right. Yes, yes. So that explaining, like, your, the boosting would be more easy to overfitting because you're actually going down to every single error term going forward. So you use the Ren Forest. I actually learned from the previous exam, the PCA one, that I am, I need to tune a threshold so that I have a better um, result on the AMS. So I actually spend for every model I run first, I didn't really use AMS as a tuning, as my optimization metric. And then after sat a Saturday and Sunday was all spending on this. So after tuning, I tried manually with different threshold. This is the best result I got of on the AMS on the test data set. Um, so the case on this I learned is the trick case is to find the threshold. So I spent most of my time on the gradient boosting model. Uh, this is the ROC curve using that. In this one, actually, was, I was able, I had a training grid for the threshold that I actually go through in the looping to kind of train it with the everything else. So after that, this one actually gave me the best result of GBM. I got a 3.5 on the testing. Um, and my threshold was the top 14%. So if you rank all your probability on the S signal that you have, and then you rank them, the top 15% or top 14% in this case is more likely to be your real signal. Uh, I actually read some literature on this on the scikit-learn database. Around. I put the link down there. But yeah, so I, going back to the lecture we had this morning on the Boston uh, database, where you have zero, one, your, your one appearance a lot less than the zero, so you don't have a 50-50 split how you would do that. So it's not, your threshold shouldn't be 50% anymore. So for this database, I feel like that's really the trick to tune your model, get better result. So I was pretty happy with the 3.5, honestly, uh, last night. <laughs> I didn't include the SVM here because I didn't upload it. So next is neural network. Okay, so, so uh, for a neural network uh, case, I, uh, first I need to choose the number of degree of freedom, and the strategy is instead I want to avoid the variable that, that can be correlated with each other, so I decided to take principal component analysis, and then use those principal component values as my input uh, into the neural network model. And, and basically what I choose is, I actually choose 20, instead of choosing five or 10, because I notice if I increase the number of principal components, my accuracy will improve. So that's why I, I choose 20 in the end. And, and the, so basically this is the, uh, the uh, based on the training set and the, and the test set within the big tra training set, okay. So this test set basically is a validation um, set, okay. So, Basically, you can see my, I tune a number of neurons only in one layer. I don't have hidden layers, okay? I just have one layer. Because of the tool, but the package I use uh, doesn't seem to work in multiple uh, hidden layer uh, situation. And, and you can see both the training set uh, uh, confidence is like, um, when you predict, uh, you have signal, the number of signal you predict, and, and also the observation plus the number of uh, you plus the number you predict, and there's no signal, and you also get a measurement has no signal. Uh, you that's the percentage you get, and and basically test set uh, training set is almost close to test set. So that means this training doesn't overfit, uh, just roughly uh, fit. Okay, so it's, it's right, like, like roughly eighty percent. 82, 
And but if you look at the Kaggle's uh, measures, AMS, uh, you can see that uh, the score I get test set is pretty uh, bad, right? It's one point two, and the training set is pretty good. It's because because the in in this AMS measure, you actually allowed to have a uh, uh, you know off diagonal uh, component uh, to be. Uh, not just taking into account the diagonal component of the confusion matrix. So you need to manage the other off diagonal component. And that's not the, uh, I didn't maximize um, my model so far uh, according to uh, this aspect. So what I can do is to tune, I didn't use, uh, I didn't tune the threshold for the probability uh, in my, in the neural network. So what I can do is I can tune that value so that I can optimize the, this uh, AMS uh, uh, value. So that's, that's the one thing I should tune uh, to, to see what, what kind of outcome I can get. And I also test the other way is I pull out uh, the training, I didn't get a good, uh, didn't get a good pre uh, pre prediction. I put it back to my original training set and then return my model again. I do that, it doesn't really show any improvement. So, so that strategy failed. So, so that means right now it boils down to uh, just fine tune the threshold. Yes. So, any questions? We're not done yet. So, let's take the last slide. Uh, I focus on the XG box set. So. I spent a lot of time on the program. So when I first I use the uh, R, find the R, you know the uh, allow me to automatically tune every parameter. So maybe I don't know how to tune that. So then I switch to Python, so I know how, uh, how to tune each parameter. So I really don't like the black box as well. You know, each, each parameter I can tune, I can see how much train sensitivity. We did the variable, and uh, what you said, right? And then it was a little bit stable. We didn't use because I'm great to see because it's your time is too long. Take the time we tune a couple of parameters, but it's not stable. So basically, I like not so much about the three point six, but you can easily get the three point five something. It's probably is already challenged. So there are many uh, mistakes later. So for example, at the beginning, and we, we focus on the accuracy, that's not a easy straight way to do it for this unbalanced uh, data where the signal is much lower. So we need to uh, uh, focus on the precision of the yeah, and the call. That's a maybe good one to do. And uh, for this scale, easy overfit. We get a high accuracy, but a very low end at the beginning, so I learned all the little bit uh, crazy to try to rely on five folder across validation that much help, much stable. So that's evident. And even though the, the, the score is something that is still very largely around three to three point or something, so we're not do some much detailed fine tuning cross validation to find the to reduce the sensitivity to the data. So another lesson I learned here is that uh, the important this kind of feature largely depend on when you're overfitting our list uh, fitting. So when you're overfitting, you will see that the every feature become important. If your list and uh, underfitting, you only see some feature get important. So that uh, I mean. Uh, on the fitting, our, our fitting can also see from that uh, kind of plot. Uh, so just some like conclusion or a lesson learned from doing this. I guess first lesson uh, I think all of us learned was knowing your outcome, like what is your final parameter. Like if you're doing a project where your client actually want. For in this case, it was the left corner on your accuracy. So if you're using confusion matrix, you're only looking at uh, accuracy as total, that might not 
get to a high score on the board. So um, that lesson, uh, we actually learned it during the weekend, so it kind of like a little time left for that tuning. That's part of the reason we didn't get to do um, put the more SVM stuff on there. Um, the other thing we learned is once your model is running like really slow, what Henry's uh, presentation last Friday was a good example where he used a sample from the entire database and then retrain that and then you put it, once you're fine tuning, you put it on that. So that might, um, instead of increasing your CPU or the power you want, that might be another method going forward, which is actually what I use for, for some of the model tuning because it's too slow otherwise. And the last thing is just teamwork because we kind of, I think everyone on the team like to do everything, every model we run through, but this is a, a week long project or two weeks long project. We couldn't do it all. So divide up the work. That's it. Thank <laughs> you.